So manyatena dikam tataha, when one attains the stage of spiritual absorption, that stage, one feels there is nothing more to be gained. Yes means thito, having been situated thus, na dukhe na guruna api vichalyate, even the greatest of distress will not disturb one. In one sense, if we look at our life, uh, this is what we all long for, isn't it? We long for some achievement with, by which that will bring contentment, that can free us from the craving for more and more and more. And we also seek uh, to either get rid of misery or at least transcend misery, by which we say, for example, we buy insurance, by which, yes, if distress comes, then at least I won't be that disturbed by it because I have some financial security. So ultimately, these two things, freedom from craving and freedom from distress, this is what we all long for. And this ultimate achievement of life, Krishna says, is not a state of relationships externally, not a state of uh, economic development, not a state of any external transformation. It is a state of consciousness. The ultimate achievement is a state of spiritual absorption that frees us from craving and lamenting or fear, fear of distress. So now how does one get there? That's what we'll be discussing in today's session. Yeah. Next slide, please. So these are three parts I'll discuss. What is, let's begin with the first part. What is meditation? So meditation essentially, now some of this will be a quick recap of what I have discussed earlier. Next slide, please. Meditation essentially means to focus our mind on the unchanging instead of the changing. We understand that there are the matter and material things externally are changing. The unchanging ultimately is the spiritual. But in this process of meditation, we may start initially with objects of meditation that can be external and tangible. Next slide. Because it is difficult for us to focus on Im immediately on some sublime spiritual non-tangible objects. So the Gita gives us certain objects Nasa, nasika, gramsum, the tip of the nose, or bruvor, madhi, the space between the eyebrows. Now, other, others in other traditions may use some other objects, a flame of a candle. They may use just a spot on the wall and focus on it. They might use some image, some natural image or some divine image to focus. So the idea over here is not so much what we are focusing on, but on the fact that we are focusing. Meditation has two, ob two aspects to it. It is the object of meditation and the, it is the object of meditation, object of contemplating of thought and the mode of thinking. So initially we focus on the mode of thinking and just try to concentrate the mind. And then eventually, go ahead, the objects start becoming internal. We start turning inward, and slowly start focusing on inner reality. And eventually, this culminates in the ultimate spiritual reality. So at this stage in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna is talking in 620 to 23, he doesn't talk about Krishna. We are, we are speaking about the Bhagavad Gita both sequentially and holistically. So sequentially, Krishna is talking about the yogis who seek inward they initially start perceiving some spiritual reality within themselves, something indestructible, something sacred, something divine. And in 647, toward the end of this section, Krishna will talk about how he is the culmination of yogic practice. He is the object of meditation of the topmost yogis. So this is a progression in meditation from outward objects to inner objects and ultimately to the innermost highest reality, Krishna. Yes, next slide. So now to understand a little bit about the mechanics of meditation, that means how does meditation work? Many of you may remember we discussed this theme of 
how the mind is like the software the soul is like the user and the body is the hardware now another similar image we had discussed when we talk about the mind is that the the mind is like the inner screen the soul is the outer scene and we are the inner seers and the inner screen the mind can if it is to function properly it is meant to be a window to the outer world but sometimes it can become a movie screen and start showing us things which distract and divert us so now in the process of meditation the mind starts play uh, playing a third role not in the process but more in the perfection of meditation as you start evolving spiritually then the same inner screen which is the mind inside us can we go ahead what happens to this inner screen so at the when the when the meditation culminates that is the state of what is called as samadhi so at this stage the inner you know, the mind changes from a screen from a window to a mirror mirror means that it starts showing us our inner reality yatra chaivat manat manam pashyan atmani tushyati shanthin the bhagavad gita at this stage yatra chaiva atmanat manam we start perceiving ourselves inside ourselves pashyan atmani tushyati that's how each of us moves forward in our spiritual journey so what is described over here is that there are various stages in the process of samadhi in the process of attaining samadhi and this is again a very technical subject which i won't go into much detail but the stages which the yoga sutras describe and the bhagavad gita indirectly mentions it is mudha mudha is when the mind is deluded it's completely out of control going back to the inner screen metaphor so what is going on it is just we are passively watching we are not even aware of what is going on where on the inner screen that is the mudha stage from that mudha means deluded kshipta means means agitated so now the difference is in in the deluded state one is not agitated because one is not even aware that there is a problem one is just the mind is wandering here there everywhere and one is going along with it in kshipta the mind is going here what about this what about that what about that what about that the agitated state ikshipta is the distracted state that means we are trying to concentrate but the mind is going here and there that's ikshipta and then there's ekagrata ekagrata means concentrated so that is the stage where a student who wants to study in a noisy place will be vikshipta but a student who knows my exam is just 3 hours away will be ekagra concentrated and then nirodha nirodha is where the mind is silenced so this series of verses 620 to 20, 620 to 23 which we are discussing right now they begin with yatr uparamate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya so niruddham the same word nirodha comes over there in in the bhagavad gita 620 yoga sevaya by the study practice of yoga one comes to the stage of niruddha yatr uparamate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya yatr chaiva atmanat manam pashyan atmani tushyati so now imagine if it is a tel- if it is a like a tv screen now on that tv screen uh, on that monitor either if we talked earlier about how the mind is like a monitor which brings in inputs from the various senses and presents them so and sometimes it becomes like a movie screen now imagine that that monitor just goes off when monitor is turned off that means there is nothing being displayed on that but now depending on the kind of glass that the monitor is made of the monitor itself can be used as a mirror if we don't have a mirror around we might use our phone turn off the phone or we might turn off the screen of our laptop and look at it as a mirror so yatra uparamate chittam 
when the mind becomes silenced viruddham yoga sevaya you know what happens yatra chaiva atmana atmanam atmana atmanam the one atma refers to the mind other atma refers to the soul so with the mind the soul is seen and at that time when we perceive ourselves i am spiritual i am indestructible pashyan atmani tushyati tushyati it becomes joyful so this is what spiritual experiences come to us when we start when we practice yoga and move toward perfection so it is self perception the mind turns as a mirror and shows us who we are if you remember in a exercise we did in the mindfulness session we discussed about how we close our eyes and look at the inner screen and then try to catch sight of the inner seer but it's very difficult to catch sight of the inner seer however when the mind turns into a mirror then that inner seer comes in from you clear view next slide please so now so this is this is the stage of perfection of meditation and this is the stage where authentic spiritual experiences start coming so let's try to understand what spiritual experiences are go ahead go ahead so this is what i explained already yeah so the inner screen becomes a mirror and yatra chaiva atmanatmanam pashyan atmaitushi this is next 20 go ahead so now the ultimate spiritual experience is not just the experience of ourselves but the experience of krishna as i mentioned earlier why is that because inside us in the in the when the mind becomes like a mirror it shows us not just the soul it also shows the whole of whom the soul is a part that whole is krishna and thus spiritual experiences culminate in the experience of krishna in the perception of krishna in not just perception of krishna but in complete captivation with krishna complete absorption in krishna yes go ahead now apart from the experience of krishna there can be other spiritual experiences also sometimes in the state of spiritual experience one experiences peace serenity security as if everything is fine. i am fine how does one so different people like cross different traditions have different spiritual have had spiritual experiences and there are some specifics which may vary but there are some fundamentals which are similar and one fundamental that is similar is this that one become one senses oneself to be an observer different from the body one understand that okay this body this world it's all destructible i am separate from it so a sublime sense of serenity comes into that person that's that's one kind of spiritual experience another kind of spiritual experience people have is when they experience oneness a sense of cosmic oneness understand that the spiritual substrate that makes me that that actually makes all of existence and thus i am in one sense one with everything this a sense of oneness we will explore in detail in a future session but at this stage we just understand it the sense of oneness is also a spiritual experience so based on the focus of that inner perception either we see ourselves we go okay i am safe or we see ourselves we look around and we perceive that actually that we all everything is in one sense one and then of course there is the experience of krishna so now all these are spiritual experiences and they can be powerful and transformative because we normally have sensory experiences that we watch we watch something we eat something we touch something and sensory experiences consume our consciousness now of course sometimes when we sleep in our dreams we have certain experiences those are more mental but spiritual experiences are so rare and they can give us a great conviction that uh, even when we hear someone else's spiritual experiences they can give us conviction that there is a reality beyond beyond our sensory reality that normally consumes our consciousness 
And when we ourselves get such spiritual experiences, they can be profoundly transformative. So this is, uh, if we consider there is material level of consciousness, which is like a, if we consider two level building, it's a ground level or a level one and level two. So our consciousness rises from level one to level two gradually. And as it rises upward, then we start experiencing these higher realities. So as we rise upward, the experiences become more and more. If somebody gets a spiritual experience, then is there something more? Hey, I've attained perfection. No, actually, more important than occasional spiritual experiences is lasting spiritual consciousness. It's uh, sometimes you might just experience something and it's wonderful you experience it, but we need to rise to the higher level of consciousness. Go, uh, another metaphor which we have used for the spiritual journey is mountain climbing. We discussed this in especially Mama, in 4.11, Mama Vartaman Vartante Manusha Partha Sarvasha. How there are different paths to climb up the mountain. So now when we are climbing up a particular path, if the greenery cover is not too much, if the rocks are not coming in the way, we might get a beautiful glimpse of the peak. Or we might get a beautiful glimpse of the territory around us. And then it's just so beautiful. So that glimpse of the, of the summit of the ultimate reality, that can be a spiritual experience. However, that is not enough. We are, we are not still reached the top of the mountain. So we need to keep going. So lasting spiritual consciousness comes when we reach the top of the mountain. And various practices, various practices of various processes like Ashtanga Yoga or Bhakti Yoga, they are all pathways to go up to the top of the mountain. So when we ascend to the top, that is when actually the, we have not just a spiritual experience, but we have a spiritual state of consciousness. A spiritual experience may come and go, but once a spiritual state of consciousness is attained, that is steady. And that is what we need to progress towards. Next slide. So now we understood spiritual experiences. Now lots of people have lots of experiences which they feel are spiritual and some people are completely dismissive about this or they're just hallucinations. So are spiritual experiences hallucinations or can some spiritual experiences be hallucinations? When we, if we experience something, how do we know whether it is a hallucination or it's a spiritual experience. Let's look at all these questions. Go ahead. So now let's first begin with the difference, but understand the difference between illusion and, hallu illusion and hallucination. So illusion is basically a mistaken perception. Suppose we are walking through a maybe somewhat dark path, forest path, and suddenly we see something, something long and uh, twisted. And hey, is that a snake is going to bite me? It might just be a slow rope lying over there. So when we mistake one thing to be another thing, that is illusion. That is hallucination is when there is nothing. And we, we perceive something over there. So it's, a, it's not just a mistake, but it's a false perception. Perceiving something which is not there at all. So if we are going along a road and we suddenly feel there's a snake, but actually there's nothing over there, neither a rope nor a snake. So those who claim that spiritual experiences are hallucinations, well, they often hold that there is no such thing as a spiritual reality. Uh, there is consciousness is simply produced by the brain. And uh, when the body is destroyed, when the brain is destroyed, consciousness ends with it. And if something is imagined, if, some, if somebody experiences something, that's just a, hallucination. So it's, it's not just a mistaken perception, it is completely a false perception. So this is one conception. Now, not everything that everyone experiences is a spiritual experience, even when it's a non-sensory experience. Not a nonsense, nonsense, but non-sensory. So, non so let's look at this further. Go ahead. Next slide. 
So spiritual experiences are different from mental experiences. Now, we discussed about how there are three levels of reality, body, mind, and soul. And most of the times, we are caught up in sensory experiences. And even when we dream, we usually have some projections or some, uh, some transformation of some sensory experiences. You know, we might uh, see a beauty, somebody beautiful in our real life and then we may dream about them uh, in our dreams. So that's a sensory experience at the level of the mind. In the, in the mind we experience it. But there are certain other experiences we might have at the level, so these are mental experiences means they are not physical. And because they're not physical, and quite often people think that anything which is non-physical is spiritual. But this is a significant difference between the Gita's understanding of the nature of reality. That beyond the physical, whatever is existing is not spiritual. There is a mental level of reality and beyond that is the spiritual level. So at the level of the mind, it is separate from the body, but it is not yet at the level of the spirit. Now what experiences would classes would would be categorized as mental experiences? Please go ahead. So in the yoga tradition, there are certain siddhis. They are called as yogic siddhis. So anima, laghima, prapti, these are siddhis. So for example, prapti means so some people they can just reach out to distant objects and get those objects. So there are, say somebody might be sitting in India and they might get a date from, uh, from Afghanistan. Now this is ridiculous. How is it possible? Well, the mind exists at another level of reality different from the body. And at that level of reality, things can be accessed faster. So there are higher dimensions to reality. Just like if you consider ordinary building, if you want to go from, say, one end of the building, the top of the one top of the ceiling to the opposite side, bottom of the ceiling. Now, if it's a insect that is moving, the insect will have to move across the ceiling, then move across the wall, and then come down. Oh, sorry, if it's an ant or something like that then it'll have to move like that. But if it's an insect that can fly, an insect can just fly along the diagonal from say the, from the top of one end of the building to top of one end of the room to the bottom of the other end of the room. So when it goes diagonally, it is accessing an additional dimension, it can go much faster. But if some creature has to go along the wall, it will go slower. So when higher dimensions are accessed, certain things don't seem to be possible at lower dimensions, they become possible. But these higher dimensions are not spiritual, they are mental. And in fact, in the Yoga Sutra, it is said that these are, these siddhis, these mystic powers are actually temptations and distractions. There are physical temptations, sensual temptations where we are attracted by worldly objects. But beyond that, there are subtler temptations. The capacity to do something which nobody else can do, that can make us feel special and then we end up getting caught and don't go to the spiritual level of reality. Go ahead. Now, modern science calls these or something like this as paranormal phenomena. And there has been some research for this. Uh, this called clairvoyance, their psychokinesis. So clairvoyance is where somebody can read, say, uh, what is there in a book without opening the book or you give them an envelope and they know what is written in the envelope without opening it. What is written in the letter inside the envelope without opening it. Now we may say this is focus focus and yes, most of it is. It's simply uh, some kind of trickery. There are magicians who do magic shows in which they claim to show certain things and most of it is just simply some slit of hand and it's, it requires certain expertise by which to do that. And they do it. However, there are many experiences, many capacities, many well-documented things which defy normal explanation. So psychokinesis means basically, psycho is mind, kinesis is kinetic is movement. So psychokinesis means to get things to move 
uh, based on just the power of the mind. There is levitation. If somebody starts, somebody goes into yogic trance and they start rising above. They seem to temporarily defy the laws of gravity. Now there is telepathy. Now, among the various paranormal phenomena, there is a significant amount of evidence for a few of them. And probably the most uh, broad evidence is for telepathy. Telepathy means what? That say one person is a person sitting at one place, another person sitting in another place. And this person in the mind thinks that I'm going to tell something to that person. And somehow the other person knows it. Now, how do they know it? It's a mystery. And there now some, some researchers thought that maybe there are some subtle subtle waves that go through this. Now, Ryan was a promise and scientists who did some research. So they put, put the person who was to be the recipient of the message of telepathy in, in maybe met, in thick metallic chambers through which no known waves would pass. And still the person was able to know. Oh. So how does this exactly happen? It's, it's something which is, which, some, which quite often eludes our normal understanding. So the way to understand this is, now again, I'm not saying that anybody who claims that they can do it is doing it. Most of this is some kind of sleight of hand, some kind of trickery, some kind of deception. But some of it, but, but not all of it. There are, there are cases where people seem to know things which they normally, uh, there's no normal way to know them. So how is this known? This is at the level of the mind. As a, the mind is subtle. So the mind does not have to follow the laws of physics that apply to physical objects. So the mind can ac extend across space and time without needing uh, to follow the laws required for physical matter. Go ahead. So now such paranormal phenomena aren't necessarily are, aren't spiritual. So what I said. So mind can exert powers on matter. Now there is a, some now when normally in telepathy, what was done was more of cognitive messages. Cognitive messages means some information. Okay, what number am I thinking of? What what if I'm thinking of a playing card? What card am I thinking of? Or something like that. Now there is also something else done, that is emotional messages. Uh, in the in the study of medicine, there's a prominent um, the one well-known study, which is called which is provocatively titled as where science and spirituality kiss each other. So what was the idea? Kiss each other. They they had say they had a certain number of patients who were sick, um, maybe with a stroke or a heart attack or something like that, and they had a control group with more or less similar patients. And say one of them, those who are not in the control group, those were the main subjects. So they they had some loved ones who would sit nearby and constantly offer prayers and messages of love and uh, messages of affirmation and healing. And they found that just by sending messages like these, there was a significant statistical difference in the in how quickly and how much the the target of those messages of love got healed. And many of those people who were offering the messages, they were not, they were not necessarily offering prayers. It was just message of affection and love. So there was no nothing, prayers would make it connecting to God, that would make it spiritual, but they were simply offering their love to the other person. Now, of course, now we, again, it is not that love can cure anything and everything. And there were normal medical procedures being followed, but it was the rate of cure that happened past. So the point is, no, it was not just uh, cognitive information, but it also emotional affection that was conveyed. And even so, even more than this, so here we are talking about messages, uh, a connection that is happening, mental experience where one mind is affecting another mind, communicating with another mind. But what about mind affecting matter directly? Now, this is quite well documented. In Princeton, there was a study done on random number generations. 
generators. So what if somebody now if we have uh, say zero to nine, you have to generate a random number, and the which number it will spout out if the probability is one one tenth. So now if there is a person who sits in front of the random number generator and he says, "I want." Number six to come, six to come, six to come, and if there are these experiments are repeated. Now the numbers are generated very fast as they come up. If they if they are spread out over thousands and thousands of numbers, millions of numbers, they found that the uh, person who desired something consciously, the number the, the the proportion of that number getting generated was significantly higher. And amazingly enough, this happened. Even if the person was not right next to the machine, even if the person was in another room, in fact, they tried this experiment with many more variations. The person could be in London, and the device could be in in New York, and still there was these variations. Again, now the point here is not to try to establish that these experiences happened. The point, but the our point is that that. There are many experiences beyond the physical or the sensory experiences, and all of these are not spiritual. So these are all fascinating, and these can be helpful if they help if they help one to develop some faith that there is something beyond gross matter, there is something beyond physical reality. Now, some of these experiments might be disproven tomorrow, or some other explanation might be come up for them. So we are not here. Trying to say that these that any particular experience is an authentic experience. The point is that there is um, that there is a significant amount of evidence to indicate that there are experiences beyond the physical that exist. And our point is that everything that is beyond the physical is not necessarily spiritual. Is that so? If somebody, by the power of their intention and concentration, is able to change the Number pattern in a random number generator, that is not spiritual. That is a mental experience. That is a power of the mind. That is not the power of the soul, and that is not an experience of the soul. Next slide. So now, now what would be a spiritual experience? We talked we talked earlier about the ultimate spiritual experience is the experience of Krishna. Uh, now, what if somebody dreams about Krishna? Is that a spiritual experience? So can Krishna come in our dreams? Uh, can we have dreams about the ultimate spiritual reality? Yes, we can. If we consider that Krishna, as God, is omnipotent, we have no power to stop him from coming in someone's dreams if he decides to come. However, it's important that when Krishna comes in the dream, that alone is not going to dramatically transform our. Spiritual conscious, our spiritual life. More important than whether Krishna comes in our dream is whether we serve him after we wake up. Our eternal relationship with him is a relationship of service, of contribution, of offering ourselves to him. So it is only when we offer ourselves to him that we move forward, we grow spiritually. So. Spiritual growth is not so much a result of involuntary experiences as of voluntary choices. I repeat this: spiritual growth is not a result so much of involuntary experiences. Oh, I suddenly saw something. I felt something. I experienced something. That's good, but spiritual growth is more a result of voluntary choices. We need to choose to turn from matter towards spirit. We need to consciously choose to go up the mountain till we reach the peak. So, involuntary spiritual experiences are. If we get them, then how should we see them? We'll go to the next slide. So, if we get those experiences, now there are many devotional experiences also. There are ashta sattvika vikara as they are called. So, there are. I think. Can you please mute everyone? So there are Ashta Sattvika Vikara, where the great devotee Ashta Sattvika means eight trans Vikara's transformation. Sattvika is of the existence, as in, in the spiritual existence and spiritual experience, there are multiple transformations. Some of them are uh, 
of devotee might just break down into tears. There might be standing of hair on the body. There might be trembling of the limbs. Lord Chaitanya exhibited many such extraordinary transformations. So now these, these kind of physical transformations that are there, they result from spiritual experiences. And now here we are going further, to not the spiritual, but devotional experiences. So spiritual can be referred to generic spiritual reality. It can be referred to the sense of oneness, the sense of uh, serenity because of realizing one's indestructibility, as I mentioned earlier. But devotional means experience of Krishna. So when somebody experiences Krishna, it can lead to tangible transformations in their body also. These are, these are exalted spiritual experiences that great saints have experienced. Go ahead. Now, now, unfortunately, there have been other people who pretend to have these experiences. But how do we know if somebody is having tears or trembling? Is it, are they actually experiencing a spiritual ecstasy or are they just pretending? So there are non-imitable spiritual devotional symptoms also. Uh, so there are, there is a book called Nectar of Devotion, the Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu, where the characteristics of uh, Bhakti Yoga in its perfection are described. So there are characteristics like the physical transformation of the body, which might be imitable, but there are other characteristics that are not so easily imitable. That is Aubyartha Karlatham. That one who is a very advanced spiritualist, they never waste any time on, mon on mundane or sensual things. They are so eager for Krishna that they can't live without Krishna. They want to constantly connect with him at every moment. And the same, aware the Kalatom, that's one aspect of it. Another is Samutkanta. Samutkanta is eagerness to hear about Krishna, to speak about Krishna. Namagani Sadaruchi, they want to chant about Krishna's glories. Then there is Virakti, they detach from worldly things. So these symptoms are not very easily imitable. And that's why these symptoms are more indicative of authentic spiritual advancement than occasional intense uh, spiritual experiences or spiritual symptoms or devotional symptoms that were mentioned in the previous words. Can you go ahead? So at the stage of when we start practicing our spiritual, going, practicing spirituality and moving forward on our spiritual journey, can we have spiritual experiences? Yes, we certainly can have. And if we have them, we can be grateful for having, having had them. So we should see them as indications that we have, or that we're getting a glimpse of something ahead of us, something that we missed out on, that we have not yet reached. We are seeing that in the peak ahead, we're getting a glimpse of the beauty of that peak. Now those who imitate and pretend to have got such spiritual experiences, they are mistaken. Why are they mistaken? Because they have actually, uh, they are pretending. So the example that is given in the Bhakti tradition is that of when a woman is pregnant and she has labor pains, she cries out. But through that crying, uh, a new life is coming out. She's going to have a child. But suppose uh, some other woman who is not pregnant, she cries. But that cry is just simply crying. No child is going to come out of it. So the physical changes, the physical transformations are not as important as what is internal. So the internal spiritual substance has to be there. Just the externals are not as important. This is, so if we, have, if we get a dream about Krishna, we can be grateful. We had a dream about Krishna, but we don't have to publicize to everyone. See, oh, I got a, I, I, Krishna came in my dream. That's a great devotee I am. Well, our devotion is seen not so much by what happens to us when we are asleep, but what we do when we are awake. Go ahead, please. So, in at our stage in spiritual life, we need to have humility when we practice our spirituality. So, humility means we desire, but we don't demand. We all long for spiritual experiences. We will, we will, if we behold a beautiful image of Krishna and the deity of Krishna in the temple, then we would love to feel completely captivated to be transported 
to be lost in beholding that beauty. We would love to when uh, when Kirtan is going on to get transported. We would like to have spiritual experience naturally. So that having that desire indicates that we long for Krishna. We want to be with him. We want to love him. A desire indicates devotion. But we desire, but we don't demand. Why not demand? Because demanding is not the mood of service. Non-demanding is the mood of service. So, manye se yadi tachakyam mayadrashtum iti prabho. Later on, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita will be petitioned by Arjuna. And Arjuna wants to see the universal form of Krishna. That is, a, that is another extraordinary experience. So, it's called technically a theophany. We will get that. We will talk about it when we come to the 11th chapter. Theophany is a manifestation of God within nature. So, when Arjuna seeks to see the uh, universal form, he says, he, he requests with humility. Manya say, my dear Lord, if you think, if it is possible for you, if it is possible for me to see rather, Maya drashtum iti prabho yogeshvar tato metvam darshayatmanam avvayam If it is possible for your Lord, please show me your form. And a Lord, he does show his form. So a devotee desires but does not demand. So we seek not, then what should we seek when we are trying to practice spiritual life? That's the last slide. Can you go ahead? So we focus not on the experiences but on the express way. The Bhagavad Gita gives us an express way to rise to spiritual consciousness. And we focus on moving forward on that express way. If we focus on that, we will gradually rise to a higher level of reality. We will come to the peak of the mountain. And once we come to the peak of the mountain, we will experience, we will have spiritual experiences. The focus is on staying on the expressway and moving forward on the expressway, not on just on seeking experiences. So I'll summarize what I first spoke today. If we, uh, we started, started by talking about three topics, what is meditation? I'm oh, sorry, started by talking about what is meditation, what are spiritual experiences and are they hallucinations? So meditation begins by shifting our focus from the unchanging to the changing, changing to the unchanging. We may have external object of meditation initially, but eventually we move towards the inward object of meditation. And then as we move inward, we start experiencing higher realities. And to understand, I talk about how we have inner stage in the mind. At the stage of Nirodha, the, the mind stops showing any images, either as a window outside or as a TV screen showing something else. But it becomes like a mirror. And we start seeing ourselves internally. And then, talked about what are spiritual experiences, their experiences of a higher level of reality. And we differentiated between hallucination and illusions. So spiritual experiences, some people dismiss them as hallucinations. But they can if on the spirit somebody is on the spiritual path and they, they have some experiences, their experiences are not so much hallucinations as illusions. What does it mean illusion? That we may be mistaking mental experiences to be spiritual experiences. Hallucination is a False perception. There is neither a snake nor a nor a, a rope, but we must we see something. On the other hand, uh, illusion means there is a rope. We mistake it to be a snake. So those who are materialists, they consider all such experiences to be hallucinations. But but in the on the Gita spiritual path, we understand that some of these could be hallucinations. Some of these could be tricks of a sleight of hand or tricks, but many of them may be illusions. Illusions means we mistake a mental experience to a spiritual experience. And mental experiences, I talk about multiple things. What the Yoga Shastras talk, Yoga texts talk about is the mystic Siddhis, like Anima, Mahima, and like Prapti. And I talk about how that is possible through accessing the higher dimension. And then we talk about what something which has been more in contemporary parlance and something which science has investigated. And the jury is out as far as the evidence is conclusive or not. But 
there is there is significant uh, findings with respect to telepathy with where cognitive messaging is done between minds or between the healing potency of loving messages are being given between two people and of course of the effect of mind on random number generations and then i talk about spiritual experiences means experiences it can be of uh, a sense of cosmic oneness a sense of indestructibility a perception of the all attract to divine krishna there can be various spiritual experiences and on the spiritual path right now can we have spiritual experiences yes we can and if we have them we can be grateful but we shouldn't take them as themselves signs of spiritual advancement uh, because our spiritual growth depends not so much on what happens to us on the involuntary experiences we have but as much as it depends on the voluntary choices that we make so we focus not on the spiritual experiences that we are getting but on the whether we are moving forward on the spiritual express and if we keep moving from the bottom of the mountain to the top steadily by the practice of yoga we will attain spiritual experiences and not just spiritual experiences but we will attain a spiritual state of consciousness where such experiences will become enduring thank you very much hare krishna so we we'll look at some questions here okay what does the inner seer look like how to know if you are able to see the inner seer well the inner seer is of course we are says the atma so the atma, the soul is presently in a seed form bija roopa bija roopa means it's a is a spark of consciousness so now what exactly will be pursued by a person on the spiritual path that can vary because the soul's as the soul's consciousness develop the soul evolves the perceptions can be different but essentially one starts perceiving one's own indestructibility one starts understanding that i am different from my body i am different from my mind i am different from my situations i am different from my emotions that's that's what we could say as perception of the inner seer now in on the path of bhakti the external objects of perception are sadhana sadhya also well yes and no yes in the sense that when we look at the deity of we hold the deity of krishna we ultimately want to see krishna and the deity of krishna and krishna are non different yes they are non different at the same time there is a direct experience of krishna in the for example in the damodar ashtakam it is said that the first in the in the fourth text the fourth and fifth text satyavatmuni is longing to remember the lord in the heart and then he says my dear lord i also want to see behold you with my senses with my eyes so there is a the, although it's the same it's also not the same there are different degrees of experiences so when we behold the deities right now and when we are purified and we behold the deities that's different why because uh, we will be more purified we will be more realized and when we behold krishna that will also be different why will it be different because krishna is beyond any material description or depiction so in the in uh, Lalita Madhav, which is the book written by Rupa Goswami, he says that actually when we, uh, when uh, a poet or artist writes about Krishna, depicts Krishna, uh, that is a way in which we get a sense of who Krishna is. But then this poet says that, my dear Lord, I thought I I glorified you with very beautiful choice poetry, but now when I am seeing you, this experience is so different. and i feel that my glorification was actually a minimization of you i whereas you are the emperor of the world i glorified you to be the landlord of the village so our words our art none of this can fully ever describe krishna so sadhana and sadhya are same in the sense that krishna can choose to manifest as the deity however what we perceive right now 
is not Krishna directly. We are perceiving the deity. In this, we are perceiving the. We may perceive the deity to be made of marble, or we may perceive the deity of made of wood or clay or whatever. So there is Bhakti Rao Thakur talks about multiple levels of perception of the deity. So yes, the object ultimately is the same. That when we are experiencing Krishna right now, and when experiencing Krishna, it's saying Krishna. But our our experience of that object will be different. So in that sense, it's achintya bhida bhai. There is oneness also, and there is difference also. And when we chant, is it good to just focus on the holy name simply by hearing and prevent the mind from hallucinating anywhere else? Anything else? Yes. You have to see what works. The point is to connect with Krishna. Sometimes focusing on the sound helps. Sometimes uh, thinking of something connected with Krishna also helps. I, I wouldn't call that as hallucination. If we if we remember a verse, if we remember, if we have a picture of Krishna in front of us and we look at it, or if we remember a beautiful darshan of Krishna which we had, if that helps us to focus on the holy name, that's good. The point is we have to remember Krishna. And I told you, what is the difference between say dream, hallucination, and illusion? Dreams are complicated. D dreams can be various things. When we dream, it is a, usually a combination of something of two real things which we have perceived. They are combined in an illusory way. Say, for example, we might have seen a gold and we might have seen a mountain. Then in our dream, we might see a golden mountain. Now, sometimes in dreams, we experience something so vividly that there are physical transformations. If we feel that we are being chased by a tiger in a dream, we might wake up and we might see ourselves panting and sweating because of that. That's because it's a, it's a, it's a very intense experience at the level of the mind, which has happened. Which has had an effect on the body. So, our, we don't call really, when we talk about illusions, it's a mistaken perception. Hallucination, hallucination it's a false perception. Dreams can be both, and dreams can be something else also. Dreams can be a concatenation of different images that we have brought together. Dreams can be also a result of one's past karma. Well, David Yabhushan. In his Vedanta Sutra commentary, states that like some people may always have bad dreams. Now, why do they have those bad dreams? It's at one level, if we have done some bad karma in the past, we might constantly have bad things happening to us. At one level, bad things happen to everyone. But for some people, life is much, much tougher than others. So we understand that uh, that is the result of bad karma. So some people have constant bad dreams. We all may have bad dreams sometimes. So he explains Valdev with devotion that we get the results of our subtle of minor karma in our dreams. The gross karma, the serious karma that we have done, we will get the results at the, phys the results of those at the physical level. The results of minor karma we get at a mental level. So dreams can be multifaceted. We have to uh, we have to check uh, based on what is the context, the content, and then understand. Usually, there is no need to become too obsessed with dreams because our spiritual growth depends on what we do with our conscious free will, and the possibility to exercise our conscious free will is mostly there in our waking state. In the dream state, things just happen and we just act accordingly. We're not really consciously choosing to do things. And last question, which I'll stop. How can if we know if we have had right spiritual experiences and what is the change that we feel when we have this? Basically, we can't know in and of itself whether an experience is spiritual or not. We should look at the consequence. If that increases our material detachment, it increases our spiritual attachment. If it increases our spiritual commitment, so that we can develop greater material detachment and greater material attach spiritual attachment, then we can say that spiritual experience is spiritual.
so thank you very much for your attention and participation hare krishna